Hello, everyone, and um, welcome to this our second uh, graduate training series, GRITS, for uh, fall 2022 semester. Thank you for all coming today, um, those of you in person and those of you in Zoom. Uh, just a couple of announcements before we begin. Um, we're partnering with CAPS for the next GRITS, and that's going to be in two weeks' time on October the 27th. Um, and the topic is going to be conflict management. Um, that same week, there'll be a graduate student social in, on October 24th in the David B. Haight Harassments Hall. That's over in the Alumni Center, right? Yes. And um, please RSVP do that so we can gauge how much food to get. Um, and now I, it's my pleasure to introduce our honored guest and speaker today, um, <clears throat> Dr. Abby Benninghoff. Um, uh, she is a professor of toxicology at the interim department head for the Department of Animal, uh, Dairy and Veterinary Sciences here at Utah State University. Um, Dr. Benninghoff has been at Utah State University since 2010. From 2018 to 2022, he served as the Associate Dean for Research and Graduate Student Services in the College of Agriculture and Applied Sciences. Professor Benikoff is a very successful researcher with uh, a number of funded research projects and over 55 um, refereed publications. And throughout her time here at USU, Dr. Benikoff has been extremely active in Graduate Student Matters. She spent six years on Graduate Council, which advises the Vice Provost <coughs> on Graduate Matters. As mentioned before, she was Associate Dean for Research and Graduate Student Services <coughs> for the College of Agriculture and Applied Sciences. Um, Professor Benninghoff has mentored numerous graduate students and undergraduate researchers in her lab. And in 2016 was recognized as USU's Graduate Mentor of the Year. That's the highest award that we give for graduate student mentoring here at Utah State University. Um, Dr. Benninghoff has participated in GRITS before in the BC area, era, that's to say before COVID. Um, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome her back to, um, to this forum. Thank you. Thank you, that's a wonderful introduction. Uh, as we get started, can everyone hear me? Okay, fantastic. So it's great to be here now that I'm have gone to the so-called dark side. <laughs> I, I don't get to teach much anymore. So the opportunities I have to come and visit with students are very special for me. So thank you for having me today. Um, as uh, our esteemed leader mentioned, I have done a great seminar in the past on a fairly similar topic. I think it was maybe 2015 or so. I came in and talked about strategies for data visualization for how to design good figures for publication. Interestingly, I've given this a lot of thought over the years. And every time I put together a paper or I work with a student on data, I'm thinking about how can I make my data more clear easy to understand, quick to understand. And so my thinking on this has evolved over time. And I would encourage the same for you. Every time you sit down with your data and you start thinking about how to put a figure together, think about how can I make this better than maybe the last time I put a figure together. So if you were to look at my very earliest publications, uh, after today's seminar and say, oh, Dr. B, you didn't follow this rule or that rule or that rule. That's because uh, my thinking and actually the, the broader community thinking about how we visualize data has grown over time. So um, today I have some slides for you. We'll walk through um, some design principles. As I go through this, I want it to be very interactive. So there'll be times where I pause and I will use that teaching trick where I stand here and I'm silent and I will wait till somebody speaks up. So if you want to avoid the awkward silence, which I don't really care for, please come in, pipe in. I want this to be a really inter interesting conversation for us today. All right. So I'm going to start off with a few resources and I believe you're provided a handout. Um, I wanted to make sure that you had 
these links. Uh, I, I'm fine. The presentation I understand is being recorded. Is that correct? Um, so it'll be available for you later, but there are a few really good resources and links that I think you might like to visit as you're working on your own data and thinking about applying some of these principles. So one of the first, um, Edward Tuff, this is a book, again, it's kind of an old book, but some of these concepts are really important. Um, so Edward Tuff wrote The Visual Display of Quantitative Information. A more recent resource is from Klaus Wilkie. Uh, he authored Fundamentals of Data Visualization 2019. What's awesome about this resource is that it's public domain. It's free and available online. So I've got that link for you. If you are brand new to data visualization, I suggest you really dig into that resource. Uh, Dr. Wilkie uses R. How many in the room use R for their data? One person in the back, one person up here. Um, so if you're using R, this will be really intuitive for you. If you don't use R, it might be a way to kind of enter into that realm for putting your plots together. Uh-oh, do we have timing set up on this? I'm gonna escape, make sure I don't have any timing set. <laughs> um, no, no patients, no timings. Start this one more time. Okay, another tool um, from Kieran Healy, uh, Data Visualization, a Practical Introduction. Uh, I use that resource a bit. And then last, we have a homegrown resource whom I learned a lot uh, about more modern thinking and data visualization, that's Sarah Schwartz. She's over in the College of Education. She uh, works in their uh, core uh, group that provides statistical support for students in that college. Um, she gave a presentation in 2018 here at Utah State. And um, you can go to her website um, in the College of Education. She's got tremendous information. For example, if you want to learn R, she's got some step-by-step -step guides on how you do that. Um, she's just developing tremendous resources for you. So I appreciate all Sarah's done in this realm and thank her for teaching me about some new things in data biz. So my take home message, and you'll see it's on your handout, um, is that uh, the best graph is one that gives the viewer the greatest number of ideas in the shortest amount of time with the least ink in the smallest space. <clears throat> So if you think about a plot in a paper that you read and, and think about that figure, it probably has multiple panels, the images are really tiny. If you're old like me, you might have to do and take your glasses down off your nose so that you can actually see the text. Um, you have to convey a lot of information in a little bit of space. And thinking about the time those people have to read the article, they may be skimming it. They may be looking at it while they're walking to their next seminar. You need to be able to convey critical information in a short period of time. So if we follow these principles and think about our audience, those people who are looking at our figures, think about how much information you're trying to convey and try and do it in the least time, the smallest amount of ink in the smallest space, you'll be on your way to some good data visualization. Our graphics do reveal that data and they're communicating complex ideas and dependencies, understanding how those data relate to each other, relate to experiment design. And those graphics need to be clear, precise, and efficient. So this is a really good quote from um, Edward Tuff, kind of that grandfather of data visualization. So with these thoughts in mind, I wanna start out asking, what makes a figure bad? If we look at example figures, if the next time you go to a presentation, we have one in this room at 12 o'clock if you'd like to come, and you're looking at that, that speaker's figures, you can learn a lot from what you don't like. You might say, I don't like those colors. I don't like the way this was designed. It took me, I had to study this. It took me too long. So let's think about some things we don't like or, or issues of bad graphic design. So part of this would be aesthetics the color choices, similar choices, how dense the figure is, how small the figure is. We can also have issues of substance. Is the graphic communicating the point that is intended? Uh, are the data clear in how they're represented? Are they miscommunicating or poorly designed such that the real trends are obscured in some way? And then perceptual, can somebody read that graph and read it correctly? So we're gonna walk through some of these issues of bad graphic design. So 
What do you guys think about these two plots? This is that interactive part. That one is very busy, the one on the right. The one on the right, incredibly busy. Even if it was blown up really, really big, it'd be really hard to understand what's going on in that plot. Yeah. This other plot, the one on the left, um, having it in three dimensions doesn't add anything to the dimensions. It's just be a two dimensional plot. Yeah. It, it's been made fancified for the sake of being fancified. <laughs> I like to create my own words. Um, any other things with the plots? Yeah. The left one is kind of hard to understand. I, I got to think a little bit. Yeah, you have to study it. I mean, really, a simple bar plot could convey that information pretty easily. But with this barrel sized bars, like cylinders with the shading in the back and the 3D form, you, you, it kind of distinct hides the data, hides the real relationships there. Yeah, okay, love it. The actual information is hard to find. You don't know what they're measuring because you can't read it. They're, those are simplified to make room for the graph. <laughs> yep, and here. Yeah, the legend on the one on the left. Like, I, what's MP, what's OE, what's T, what's TVC? And yeah. it says percent of sales, and then the bottom one says sales. It's just like kind <laughs> of... You don't really know what's being shown. And there was another in the back. I was just wondering about the colors. Like, I don't know, red just looks, I think of negative stuff when I see red. And so I was just thinking, I wouldn't use red. No, there's a lot of um, color theory in, in connections to emotions and how people perceive things. Um, I, and sometimes you get color combinations that people just recoil at. I've seen, I have an example poster that I show in another workshop that's Chartreuse and sky blue. And I'm thinking, what was somebody thinking there? I, I just don't get it. So yeah, there are lots of things we don't like. One more. Oh, I'm just wondering, are you going to be resources for um, like choosing colors for colorblind people? Yeah, and going to talk black it. versus white. Okay, I just was hoping it was also. Yes. Um, not quite a segue, but good precedence. Oh, well, sorry. That's <laughs> getting ahead of myself. So let's, so we've talked about things, aesthetics, things that we don't like, busy graphs, wrong colors, obscure information. We can also have problems with substance. So, you know, that would be how kind of showing data in a way that's misleading or really hard to interpret. So if we have this plot here, and I'm gonna get rid of this little guy so you can see it. So what problem do you see with this particular plot? You can hardly see any change in the in the trend there. It looks like there is some change, but you can't really see it. It's blown up too much that you the difference is not. Yeah, much. it's really not telling us much there. And so this is a plot of mean global temperature over time from 1880 to 2020. And if you designed a plot, what kind of message do you think the person who designed this plot might be trying to convey? <laughs> Climate change denier. <laughs> <tonight. laughs> be like, look at us. Change. Yeah, so that's mis that's prop that's misleading, perhaps, right? That table line. Um, so here's another way to present that data. Here, what we've done, or the author of this plot has done, is taken that range, the actual dynamic range where there's change going on, and it, and only shown that range. And so they've offset the axes. So now you're going from 56 to 60. And you can see trends. Another nice thing here is that there's a reference line. So actually, I made these two plots. I pulled the data from some, uh, I think, NASA database and made these plots. But if you were going to see a version of this from NASA, they would actually present this as a temperature anomaly. So they actually set a reference line and then plot deviation around that reference line. So it's very clear what's going on in terms of recent trends in temperature compared to an old baseline set in the 1800s. So that helps avoid problems with bias introduced by a weird scale. So this is an example of a substances, some substantive issue. And then there are perception issues. Um, so these are data from our AAA office on graduates in STEM disciplines. So what do you think about these two plots? So like the one on the left, I kind of think about like a, it's kind of in the same realm as like a pie chart where like you really can't tell 
when you're when you're cutting a pie in half, you don't really know you're. Yeah, so, if it was fifty one versus forty nine, you wouldn't be able to perceive that difference, right? And so that's a challenge with the plot on the left. It kind of looks like. All right, women are around 46%, men are around 54%, and it looks pretty stable over time. Well, those of us who, who care about these sorts of things would probably prefer to see the data in the format on the plot on the right. Look at the actual ranges and how they're changing over time. And what we're seeing is that there's an increase in, in the rate of women completing degrees in STEM and a a matching proportional decrease in men, which for us, you know, those of us who work in STEM, hey, we're coming closer to parity, which is probably a good thing. So these two plots send very different messages. And what I want you to think about is the way you design your plots, you have a lot of control over the message that is being sent. Now in science, is that a, you know, how, we have to think about that from an ethical lens, right? The data are the data, how we present them, we can put spin on that. And if we do that in, a, in, the, in an inappropriate way that highlights things that maybe aren't really real um, or disguises trends, we, we have to be very careful about that. So just want to put that thought there for you. So probably we would prefer the plot on the right here. Okay. So this is a little graphic that talks about how if you take away some of the design elements of a plot, removing data ink, you can make a plot simpler and much easier to understand. And I'll let this cycle through at least twice so you can see it. But you can, ultimately you get to a plot that is very similar to something you might see in a newspaper article where the general public needs to get that information within a split second. You might take away some elements of this plot that you would want in a scientific article. But the point here is that less is more. Using fewer design elements works out better. So I'll let this cycle through and you can see you know, borders, backgrounds, lines across behind, shadows behind the bars, simplifying the color scheme. So you focus only on, like, I think bacon is the, the point here that's being emphasized in this article. So, Generally, simpler design is better, easier and more quick to understand that information. So I'm going to start out with, as we start moving away from things that are problematic about graphics into how we design good graphics. I'm going to start from a very basic um, framework. And my apologies if this feels too basic for you. But we need to start at the beginning in order to get to good graphics at the end. So when we think about the various attributes that we can assign to our data when building a graphic, there are three classes that we can consider. The position of a data point. So if you have a plot that has an X, Y axis, where that data point is on the axis is one uh, attribute or two attributes if you have two axes. The shape of your symbol is an attribute that can code information for that particular data point. And the color can code information. So when we think about these different aesthetics and how they can code information, you can get a lot of detail out of a pretty simple plot. So here's an example. And these most of my examples today are from Klaus Wilkie's book. Um, and I've got a link there for you if you want to go and follow okay. these up. So for this simple XY plot, we have five at, uh, uh, levels of coding information. So the X axis is talking about displacement. The Y axis is fuel efficiency. So the position in two different axes, the color of the symbol is the power. I'm guessing this is cars. Um, uh, the data set is, has to do with cars. The size of the symbol has to do with the weight of the vehicle, and then the shape is cylinders. So I can come in here and look at a data point. Let's say, let's take one of these over here. So it's a pretty big circle. So this is, looks like it's about a five, so about 5,000 pounds. Its displacement is greater than 400 cubic inches. Its frequency is around 15 miles per gallon. It's a circle, so it's an eight cylinder. Hey, this sounds like my Jeep. Um, actually, this is so exactly like my Jeep. 
and it's got a decent power to it by virtue of color. So it's a, it's a bit over 200 horsepower. Wow, well, that's exactly my Jeep. So we can compare that probably to a Mini Cooper. So let's say probably over here, it's a diamond. So it's four cylinder vehicle. It's a dark color. So under 100 horsepower, it's got great fuel efficiency. So good for you know the high gas costs. And its engine displacement is less than 100 cubic inches. Tons of information in a simple plot. We have questions. I was thinking like, if there are more weights, like six, seven, eight, when they're much more closer, won't it be difficult to identify between six, seven, five, four? You're right. So the so on the weight, this is one concern perhaps with using the size of the cylinder. So in that case, if you're going from two to let's say a 10,000 uh, pound vehicle, I would bend those bigger. So you're not trying to dis start discern by a thousand pounds, but between 2,000, 5,000, 10,000. So you have, when you design your plot, you have to think about how easy is it for somebody to recognize, is that the smallest circle or whatever shape you choose or the biggest one? Um, so you have to think about the scales. Also, um, you know, with cylinders, there are a lot of different shapes you can choose from. But if you start getting into um, stars with eight points versus six points, it gets harder for your audience to see those differences. So you have to be judicious in how much you're trying to code within any one of these aesthetics. Is it possible to add some sort of color in the weight as well? Uh, well, like just to show that someone some some points are heavier than others, like maybe dark blue and. Well, the challenge you would have for this plot and that is that you're using color for power. Mm -hmm. So how does a symbol have more than one color attribute? You can only really have color for one attribute. And then the rest either has to be uh, the shape of the symbol or the size of the symbol. And frankly, if you're trying to code too much information, if this doesn't really work for you, if the range of information is too much, then I would encourage you to go into a different type of plot, maybe move into a multi-panel figure where you separate out your data based on cylinders and, and have um, a plot for each class of cylinders and then look at power and weight within the cylinder. That's something I do. A lot of my experiments have three or four experimental factors and it gets much too crowded if I try and cram it all into one plot. So I focus in um, a lot of my data is over time. So I focus in here are the effects of my diet and my drug at the first time point, and then the second time point, and then the third time point. So I, I separate out my data. I was thinking, will it look too fancy if we use three different colors, like, like instead of one color? Yeah, like for power, weight, and cylinder, we use sort of similar color base. So can we use different colors for like waves and cylinders? Well, what if you had a, a car that had, let's say 300 horsepower mm -hmm. and had eight cylinders. And if you use the same color scale, which color then you assign to that point? So color can only be used for one, um, yeah. Yeah, one dimension, one type of attribute. I have a question. Yeah. I'm very interested in that tiny, tiny speck of a dot. Yeah. I don't know what the that maybe that's a bicycle. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, did, I did not generate these data. This is actually, if you get into R and you want to learn R, this is a data set that comes with a package that you can practice with. The data set is called cars. Okay. So question about um color as a tool. So we can use qualitative colors to help distinguish. Um, these are some example color palettes that if you can find online. I'm gonna talk about this top one a little bit more in a slide or two. Um, the key thing that you'll notice is that these colors need to be very distinguishable from each other. So if you're trying to show uh, categorical data, for example, uh, four horsepower versus six horsepower, you'd want to use colors that have a lot of contrast and are easily distinguishable. Um, some of these colors, you like down here on ggplot hue, I would hesitate putting this pally green next to this aqua green in a bar chart. 
that so keep in mind when you're looking at color palettes just because you find a color palette online doesn't mean it's awesome in fact the default color palette that comes with r with this package called gg plot 2 and i'll you've got a link for that on your um handout i hate the default palette it's just awful it's it's not a pleasing color set. So you might want to go in and adjust your colors. Just make sure you have good contrast. You can also use colors that are in a sequence if you're representing values. So on that plot we just looked at, horsepower was shown in a color scale because you went from zero up to something like 300 horsepower. So you can also find um, color scales. So we have an example. Here's one that's just blues that go from essentially nothing all the way to a dark blue. You can get color scales that um, are not just one color in different hues, but a combination of colors. And uh, you can also have diverging colors. So if you're trying to show um, like changes above or below some sort of a reference point, using a diverging color scale is a really good choice. And I have a good example of that later on. So I want to walk through some of the typical types of plots, and I have a couple, um, you'll hear me talk about a couple pet peeves. When I review papers or look at data, sometimes people put the wrong kind, the data on the wrong kind of plot. They use um, a bar chart when an XY plot should work. So if you are visualizing a mouse, a um, version of a bar chart or a heat map, or stack bars will work. So importantly, these show the relationships between a numerical and a categorical variable. So if you've done it, if you've done an experiment where you have a control group and a treated group, those are two categorical variables. And then your response is something you've measured. So it's likely a continuous variable. Let's say numbers of tumors, since I do work in cancer. So I would choose perhaps a bar chart. Um, probably the, the best choice would be a plot something like this. I'm going to talk about an alternative that reveals the data a little bit better than a simple bar chart. Um, stack bars are often used to show relationships. So let's say I'm looking at large tumors versus small tumors. I might stack them because I'm interested in how many tumors total. And then the pr proportion of that bar might say, you had 40% of those total tumors were small and 60% were large. So you can use bar charts to also show proportional data. Um, if your experiment calls for it, a grouped bar chart is really helpful. And I have an example where I'll, we'll take a very simple bar chart someone designed uh, like this one up here in the top left, that really should be a grouped bar chart because it's the way the experiment design is put together. So take home point here, these types of plots show that relationship between a numeric, so a continuous variable and a categorical variable. On the other, yes, in the back, we're not. Go back. Um, I personally don't like the bars that go. Horse yeah. yeah, horizontal. Is there any like, advantages to you? It depends on your data. Um, in some cases, if you have, do I have a marker? Those are just for aesthetics. Those are yeah, okay. <laughs> so let's say you had a categorical uh, title that was really long. And if you tried to fit it under a bar chart, oh, we've got a prepared student. I love it. <laughs> Make sure I give this back to you when you're done. Okay, so if we have, when you might want to use a horizontal bar chart, let's say, you know, you have Utah State University, University of Utah, when they're really long, doing a plot like this, and let's say this is a plot of awesomeness. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a little competitive. Um, or Tennessee. Sorry, I'm a Tennessee alum. We play Bama on Saturday. <laughs> Maybe football scores or something, right? So when you have long titles, sometimes it's really helpful to do a horizontal plot. Also, if you have a lot of bars and you're wanting to, and you organize your data in such a way that comparing 
visually like this is really handy. And I've got an example plot later that does that. You might want to stack your data like this. Most of the time in your disciplines, a vertical bar plot will work just fine. So we actually um, just submitted a paper where we did mm -hmm. a bar graph like this. And it's because the labels for each plot were a um, RNA sequence. Ah, and so lengthy. Well, and, and each one, they're, they're like, we're, you're comparing each sequence to the next. So you want to look so up and down. Up and down, mm -hmm. and then you have the response going for yeah. the next. So the answer to the question is, you want to choose a layout of your plot that best reveals your data. And I will mix between them depending on the data that I'm showing. So if you have a horizontal plot that is really, oh, this table and I, it's really wide. And you want to compare this all the way back to that symbol or to that, that, that uh, control. It's hard for the eye to see all the way across. So you could do two things. You could put a reference line you, kind of behind your plots to help the eye look across. Or you could rotate your plot. And it's easier for the eye to see this way over long distance because it's not that long. You're looking up and down. It's easier than looking across this way. Okay. So XY plots. So last plot, categorical with a continuous variable. XY plots are when you have two continu continuous variables. So time versus response is a perfect example. And you can do these as a simple scatter plot, a bubble chart. So that's when the size of the symbol is proportional to another um, value. So that's three dimensions of data that you can include. Um, a paired scatter plot where you do regressions. Slope graphs, these are kind of before and after measurements and where you connect your two, uh, your paired samples if you're doing a repeated measure. Density contours, everybody has seen one of these if you've ever seen the weather on TV. And then, versions of density contours, 2D bins and hex bins. These are um, ways to show where uh, response is on two variables. And then you color code it for a third dimension, somewhat like a bubble chart. And then a correlogram. Uh, so a correlogram would be, you have uh, condition one and condition two, and you're looking at the correlation of those two. And that mm -hmm. bubble is colored for the corresponding R value, if you've ever done correlations. And the nice thing, you can do a lot of correlations because you can do one, two, three, four, and correlate to one, two, three, four, and all the combinations with a correlogram. So the important thing here, two continuous variables. Distributions. So now we're getting into the types of plots that reveal the patterns of your data. And I am going to run out of lots of time here. Um, <laughs> so here we're, you can do histograms, or density plots, box plots, violins. I'm going to explain to you what a violin plot is. They're really great for revealing your data. A strip chart just shows exactly where all those individual data plots are. And then you can start getting fancier and do stacked histograms, et cetera. The point here is that it shows the distribution of your values within that treatment condition or for that population. Okay, here's an anatomy of the box plot. So we have this set of samples here um, on some y-axis that I'm not showing. And if we take these, we can summarize the data in a box plot where you have the box represent that middle 50% of your data, then the whiskers can represent, you can decide what those whiskers represent. Here we have a box that shows the minimum and the maximum, and you may have an outlier. The whiskers could be your, um, maybe your confidence intervals, your 95% confidence intervals, or an interquartile range, which is a classic two key box plot. An alternative is a violin plot. And so if you think, okay, I've got an eraser. Well, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> this is called uh, oh, <laughs> yeah. Make use of your resources. 
So if you take a violin plot and you split it down the middle and then rotated it, it's just like a distribution of your data. So it's a nice way to show the distribution of your samples maybe within a, an experimental condition. It reveals um, that data distribution. Parts of a whole, you guys have seen pie charts, they're pretty common. Um, you can do stack bars, et cetera. But the point that was made earlier is when you start doing these proportions of a whole, if you're trying to compare 59%, well, 51% versus 49%, it's very difficult for the eye to discern those distinctions. So to make a plot like that work, you might add data labels to it with the numbers. Um, or if you only have a couple of groups that you're showing data for, just make a little table. Um, sometimes tables are better than a plot. Professor, can I just, yes. can I just go to the last slide? For instance, in this bar chart, I just want to emphasize on one particular bar. So instead of using like here three colors, can we use like two colors for this two and the chart I want to present in a different color, like maybe the darker one? You can use the colors you choose, just make sure you define them and what they mean. So I often will color my bars in such a way where my control group is a color and then my treatments are shades of a different color. And I actually have a perfect example of that in, a, in another couple slides. So yes, choose the colors however you want. Make sure there's good contrast and that you define what those mean. Okay, so we're gonna talk about some graphics magic that will help improve your data transparency. So if I briefly mentioned earlier this concept of proportional ink. And sometimes uh, you run into problems in terms of conveying the data accurately related to proportional ink. So this top figure, we're showing the median income uh, for, for the United States for different islands in uh, Hawaii, the Hawaii island chain. And it looks like the median income in Honolulu is 10 times the median income in Hawaii. And that's actually not right because if we plot the data, where we use an access, access from zero to over 60,000, we see that it's not 10 times greater, it's maybe $10,000 more. So maybe 20% higher. So when you do data in a bar chart like this, the eye interprets those trends by looking at the area that's colored. So the top plot misrepresents that data unless you carefully look at that y-axis, which you're probably not gonna do. You're probably gonna look at the area that's colored and make a quick judgment. So when you're doing bar charts, it's very important that you start that axis at zero. Now, here's an alternative where, and this is an example of a horizontal plot, and it is shown with the axis starting at zero. Here it's the, the x-axis showing life expectancy. And what we have is a whole bunch of color in there that's not really helpful for us. Yes, it's showing that it's all proportional, but there's a better way to maybe show this data where you take out a lot of that ink and you can see the relationships a bit better. So here we use a dot plot. And it's really easy to see with this dot plot, it's okay to start that y-axis at 60 because we're not looking at the, the ink for every single country is the same. It's the same size dot, but it's the position on that X axis that shows those relationships. So that dot plot's a really nice alternative to that bar chart, which is accurate, but just has a lot of data ink there that's not informative. But Professor, just assume we don't have Bolivia and Haiti. So then how do you present them? I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Just question. assume like Bolivia and Haiti is not there, like which is 62 and somewhere in 65 in the plot in the right, life expectancy. So Bolivia- in this one, the right one, yeah. They're right here. Yeah, so assume these two dots are not there in our data. They, they're, they're, they are right here. Yeah, so then, if, if, you if didn't they're not. Have yeah. those two, if you didn't have those, I would, I would still use a dot plot for this. It's just a cleaner plot. 
And then I would probably make my X axis here match the range of the data that's being shown. Okay, another thing that we sometimes do is visualize a lot of distributions. So in this example plot, we have dots representing means with some sort of error. And it looks like this error is the same all the way across. What is the intent of those error bars? Right now, it's not very clear. And usually an error bar shows the uncertainty of your estimate. It's not very useful for showing distribution of a, or variability in a population of data. So instead, we can use a box plot or a violin plot. And what you'll notice is that in this top graph in December, now that range of values is, doesn't look terribly different from November, but we see when we look at that box plot, wow, there's a long tail on that, meaning that there were a few pretty extremely cold days in December. Whereas the variability in temperatures is much lower in the summer. So now we've learned something not only about the means or the median, the box plot shows you the median, but we've also learned something about the variability that temperatures in the summer are more stable, whereas in the winter, you get a lot more variability. So you've learned something about the data population as well. Violin plot does the same thing. And even better, you could show it, um, that data. Down here in the right, I have an example where you show that data with the data points as well. So you see the distribution. Now, sometimes you're gonna have a scenario where um, your data set is so sparse, you really can't put together a box plot. So I have an example up here on the top where I don't have enough data for treatment D to get a tail on my box plot. Um, and, and it looks like the data are really very distributed or uh, highly variable. So in that case, I would encourage you to go ahead and plot your data as XY plots or uh, show the individual, I'm sorry, show the individual data, whether it's a bar chart or whatever. Um, trying to show a box plot or violin plot when you only have four or five points to show, you're not gonna have a lot of confidence over where that distribution is. So just go ahead and show the individual data. Okay, and the bar chart with an error bar on top, this is probably one of the most common types of plots you'll see in the scientific literature. It's called a dynamite, dynamite plot. And frankly, if you look back at my graduate school publications, they're full of these kind of plots. Nobody had this workshop for me. So the problem here is that it's got a low data to ink ratio. You've got a lot of ink without a lot of information. You know where the mean is and you know where the standard error of measurement is, but you have no knowledge of that distribution of data. Um, you don't have any idea of really what that standard deviation is either. So these are the data that I use to make that plot on the top. So you get the same mean, mean and same error with your data being perfectly, you know, very evenly distributed or where you have three at the exact same value and one high. So it's disguising the key information, right? So we don't wanna use a dynamite plot. In this for this particular example, I would be much more revealing and authentic in my presentation to just show the individual values. So let's walk through a bad dynamite plot about some of the different things we can do to adjust it to get a more informative, more clear plot. So I've got one right here. Um, I have a, lot, a high data to ink ratio. I have really uh, very little change. I'm, showing, I'm starting at zero, but it's really hard to see their relationships here. So the first thing I might do is adjust my y-axis range, but now I've created a problem because now the area that's colored is not actually proportional to the real data. So that's not going to work. We can't do that. All right. So now maybe an axis break. This is a tool sometimes people will use if they have data that ha um, has a lot of uninformative part and they cut the axis so they can show most of the graph in that range of values where there's a change amongst your different um, treatment groups. Well, that's okay. 
But we still have that problem of the area colored is really not related to the value of the data. We can do better. So, okay, let's remove all the, the data, the, the non-data ink. Now I've got just the mean with error, but now I've taken away a lot of the good information and I don't have, I'm not providing enough to my audience. So let's just show the values with the mean and the error. This right here, that's publishable. Um, I will say in my version on my computer, all these are colored full in. So I'm not sure why we're having transparency problems here. We could also summarize these data as a box whisker. I've got enough points there to be re relatively comfortable doing that. Or I could show that distribution as a violin plot. Or I could, oh, Mac to PC problems. This plot here is meant to show the individual data points overlying the um, violin plot. Uh, and I have a question. Yes. Uh, uh, if, you, uh, uh, if you're looking at the third graph, so why you were using uh, like different colors as we have all a different shape as, as well for different data? So I, my personal preference, I, because each treatment is labeled, I don't have to use different <clears throat> colors. And if I were publishing in a journal that required a color fee, I probably wouldn't, but because I'm cost is not a concern, I can help the reader distinguish the different treatment groups by adding colors and attributes to my plot. So in, in my plots, I often use one color always for my control and then different colors for other groups. And I'm consistent in those colors throughout all, actually through all my publications. So if somebody's coming to a paper this year, and looking at something I published two years ago, my control is always one color, my positive control is in the same color. So there's consistency. So it's not required for this particular type of plot, but it's helpful. Color fee, color fee. Yeah, so back in the old day, when we used to print hard copy and you actually subscribe to a journal that came to you in the mailbox, um, <laughs> you had to, you would get charged at B a lot of times for a color picture because it costs more to print. And a lot of journals still impose a color fee for the added production effort for making a figure in color. But with publications moving more towards online, that's becoming less of a thing. So you would just want to, if, you've, if you're getting ready to put a paper together, go to that target journal and look at the instructions for authors and they'll tell you whether they want any color fees to that paper. Oh, again, on color search. So you said we might be able, if we have time, mm -hmm. to talk about <clears throat> colorblind palettes versus mm -hmm. grayscale palettes. Are there palettes where they're both colorblind helpful so that you can have your figures in black and white yes. in one version and then also a color? I'll make sure we get to that slide. I probably will go over it about 10 minutes. Um, this is good stuff, so I hope you can stay. So um, another challenge that comes up for data I commented on using categorical plots for continuous data. So for this particular example, we have uh, treatments that are labeled control 20, 100, and 500 milligrams. If we look at these data trends, it looks like there's a linear response to increasing doses of this drug. But there's really not because these data are actually continuous. This control is essentially zero milligrams. So if you plot that data on a categorical axis, you're misrepresenting the relationship. This is how it actually looks. So you have a rapid increase and then a plateau in response. So if I was a physician and I'm and do, recommending a dose of this drug, you might think for the first plot, 500 milligrams is a lot better than 100 milligrams in terms of your response. Where in fact, you're plateauing out really at about that 100 milligrams and the added, uh, the higher dose may not con confer much, much extra benefit. So always plot continuous data on a continuous scale. Here's an example of a complicated experiment where we have two experimental factors, diet, low fat, high fat, and then the supplement. And we have either no supplement, five, 10, or 20 units of that supplement. I see this kind of plot a lot, but it's not the right way to show this data. And I see a, a 
a not a negative response, so an agreement. This is the better way to show it as a grouped plot. So now you, you're revealing that two by four design in your grouped plot. Here's an even better way to show that data. So because control of five, 10, and 20, that's a continuous scale. So this data really should be in an XY plot. So you're taking out that non-data ink, putting together a clean, easy to interpret plot, and more easily seeing the trends in response to that treatment for either a low fat or high fat diet. Much clearer and easier to interpret. Okay, some pitfalls to avoid. Don't try to put too much information in your plot. This connects to a question very early on. So here we've got 50 states and 50 different colors, and I bet you can't tell the difference between Colorado and Connecticut on this plot. I can't. They're too close together in shade. So here's an alternative this author used. Um, they grouped their colors by region and put a data label to call out the states that they were particularly interested in. So that's a, a different way to accomplish the same thing. And here's an example of a horizontal bar chart where somebody got very rainbow happy. <laughs> and you're wondering, what's the message of this plot? You really can't tell. So the, the rainbow color scheme really doesn't help in any way. But this other version where we've used colors and grouped our data by region, we can easily discern that uh, population growth has been pretty high in states in, that are in the West and in the South, or it's been pretty low in the Midwest and the Northeast. So a simple change in your color aesthetic quickly conveyed that information. Okay, monochromatic, monotonic color scales. So again, if you go online and look up color scales and you're wanting to implement one, keep in mind that with certain scales, colors will stand out. So the rainbow scale, this one right here, that's used a lot, we have sometimes problems with certain colors catching the eye more than others. So you get this perception of certain data jumping out where it really doesn't according to the scale it's applied to. So here's an example. So these are counties in Texas that have been colorized by the percent of the population that identifies as white. Really pretty hard to see the patterns here because colors that jump out like this bright neon green jumps out to my eye, but it's close to 50%. This is a much better way to color the scale. It's a diverging color scale where the lightest colors in, the, in that middle and you can see the part, the areas near the Rio Grande Valley have low percentage of the population identifying as white, whereas the areas in the Panhandle and the uh, Northeast part of the state have higher percentages. So it reveals the data much better. Okay, designing with visually impaired in mind. I'll pay the color fee, I want it in color. So the trick here up at the top, and unfortunately the, the Zoom thing is right now, what can I move that? Aha, get that out of the way. So we have an example here of a color scheme that uses red, uh, a red to green scale. Here's what that would look like for somebody with uh, different types of color blindness. So if you have deuteronomaly or protonomaly, don't ask me what those mean, um, or even trinomaly, it's difficult for somebody to distinguish those different color, um, color distinctions. However, this pink to green color scale actually works pretty well. So somebody who is um, who has deuteronomy would perceive that as blue and brown or pronomaly with blue and brown and trinomaly would be more of a red and green. So this color scale works for people who are colorblind. This is a fantastic um, color palette that works for all color deficiencies. Um, so if you, I, I hope I put, it's in um, Cross Wilkie's website. So I've, the hex numbers are there. So if you want to employ this color palette, it works. Okay. Okay, multi-panel plots. So using multiple panel plots will work if you've got data with a lot of dimensions, which we kind of talked about earlier. 
So this is a version where you've got um, the counts of passengers on the Titanic, a column for people who died, a column for people who survived, and the rows indicate whether they were first class, second class, or third class passengers. So it's pretty easy to see the distinctions where you generally had um, more people who survived if they were first class passengers versus third class passengers. So you can see those relationships here really easily. This is a uh, this plot was made using what's called the facet option in R, but you can create your own grouped plots in a lot of different software. The important thing to think about is aligning the scales using consistent coloring so that the figures look like they belong together. Here's another example that, uh, that really reveals the challenge of using different scales. So on the left, we have um, the proportion of degrees awarded in different professions. And if I were to take a quick look at this, I might say, wow, psychology, this is the degree program to be in. Look at how fast those proportion of degrees are rising. Yay, psychology. Hopefully there are no psychology students in here that are gonna be offended because when we look at the plot on the right, we realize actually compared to all the other disciplines and everything is put on the same scale, psychology is actually kind of flat. Whereas I don't see agriculture on here. <laughs> um, business has been up. Um, social science is history, a bit of a decline. So th this data, when you're trying to compare what's in one panel to another panel within the same figure, you really should most of the time use the same scale so that you're not making erroneous um, associations. Okay, again, when you're doing mixed panel plots, be consistent in some of those design attributes. These are three very different kinds of plots, a bar chart, scatter plot, and box plot, but we've got male and female data and we've been very consistent in how we've colored that. So it's very clear from panel to panel what's being shown. I would also argue if you're going to show male and female data, don't use pink and blue. Um, <laughs> you know, don't fall into you know, the, the focal pros. Okay, so just a thought about when you're analyzing your data and thinking about the quality of your data, you, you don't want to chuck out data without a reason, but you also want to be skeptical when you're looking at your data. So on this top plot, I have a, a scatter plot and I have two regressions shown. One with these four uh, symbols that I've colored blue and one without. If I don't include those four particular data points, I have no relationship in that data. So the skeptical scientist might ask, is there something about those four data points that I should pay attention to? Maybe all four of those data points are from one uh, cage of animals, or maybe they were all grossly overweight, or maybe they were all sick, whereas the rest of my animals were healthy. You want to be skeptical and dig into your data and don't, don't just say, hey, I've got a relationship, I'm ready to publish. Um, so take a look at that. And if there's a scientific reason that you need to consider those separately, discuss it with your mentor. You might plot it in just this way in your paper to be completely transparent about your data, but acknowledge that that relationship depends on those four data points for which there might be a question. Also, when you're doing um, some data analysis, sometimes we'll do curve fitting. Don't massage your curve fit to fit your data. You should decide on the uh, algorithm that you're gonna use, the formula for your curve fit before you do your experiment. Don't go in and start changing parameters to make it fit your data after the fact. Um, I've shown here in this plot, we have these data that are represented by asterisk symbols. And really, if you try and fit this curve to it, it doesn't mean anything. It's not very useful. Okay, I'm gonna skip this part because I'm gonna get to the, uh, yeah. So here we have an example of a poorly formatted graph. I have seen, this is from a publication. I've seen these sorts of things before. There's a lot we can do to fix it. So we can change our font size, make it bigger, um, make the scale appropriate to the, to the data, always put your dependent, or most of the time put your dependent variable on the y-axis, 
your categorical variable on the x-axis, put your data in a logical order, um, use the same design aesthetic. So the border on my bars is the same as the border for the axis, which is the same as the border for the error bars. That, that sort of thing gives your graph a really nice polished look. This particular plot is designed in black and white as if it were going to be published in a journal. This one, if you try and reduce this plot, this checkered um, fill will become indistinguishable from a dotted fill. So generally the line-based fills reduce better. Here's another example, a poorly formatted line graph. This is generated in Excel. Excel is horrible. Um, my sister works for Microsoft, so she'll probably harass me about that, but she's not here. She's not here. Um, the, the problem, it, it's just really hard to get consistent aesthetics because the program thinks a bit for you. Um, so if we take that Excel plot and fix it, we've got nice big symbols. We show the error with the symbols. It's really clear which group belongs to which. Um, we also follow the same as some of the same aesthetics. So there's a lot that you can do to get a plot looking nice and clear with good aesthetics. Avoid the 3D temptation. Our very first bad example, you guys caught that. If it doesn't help your data, don't bother it. What really becomes a problem is when somebody puts together what they think is a nice sophisticated plot like the one on the right, but you can't see any of these data that are hidden in the back. So it becomes pointless. It looks pretty, but it's pretty useless. Yes. So would it be better to represent data like that as a heat map? Instead? Yes, a heat map would be a really good way to do that. That said, keep in mind, heat maps have the same challenge as uh, proportional plots. It's very hard to see slight deviations in color, but it's good for overall patterns. So I use heat maps if I'm trying to look at like a whole profile of gene expression for one treatment versus another, and you can see patterns and changes. But if I'm interested in gene XYZ in treatment A versus B, I should extract that data as its own plot. If you're going to use pictures as a figure, labels are your friend. Highlight key things within the figure that are important. Make sure the legend or on the figure itself, you define what the colors are. Um, these are two very nice uh, color figures uh, that are pictures. Um, that I thought did a really nice job of providing that information. On this one, I particularly like how they took it, uh, insects of their main figure and then put a cartoon with it so that somebody could easily see the pattern that they're talking about. A lot of us use complex diagrams. If you're going to do this in a paper, you can make it somewhat complex. You've got that person has time to study it. They'll have a figure legend with it to explain. But for a presentation, aim for more simple figures. Okay, so what you put in your dissertation or your thesis, you might need to simplify for your for your presentation for your defense. Um, one trick to keep in mind when you're doing a presentation, you can use animation to build content up. So if I were showing this in a talk for my lab, I might hide all of this part um, underneath the dendritic cell and focus first on what's going on with the macrophage cell and then reveal the second part of the figure to help your audience focus on one part at a time. Infographics. Um, any of you guys ever design an infographic? Okay, so they're pretty cool. They're a neat tool for communicating complex concepts to a general audience. Um, so they're intended to be designed for non-experts. If you're gonna use one for an oral presentation though, obviously the one here on the far right, may be a bit too complicated, too big, text too small to read. But this one on risk from smoking, that's pretty straightforward. And, and if you filled your slide with it, very easy to read. Um, so when you're thinking about infographics, when should you use one? Great for a presentation or for a poster if you're going to a conference. Um, good for a public presentation, just make sure it's accessible, that you're using language that your audience can understand. But we generally don't use infographics as figures in your dissertation or in a publication. With the more recent exception 
of graphical abstracts. Anybody publish a graphical abstract yet? I need to. You need to. Okay. I'm very confused. About so there are a couple of great resources on your page. So a graphical abstract is one image, often very small, that conveys that take home message for your research study. Yeah. And it's really interesting because the journals are asking us to do these, and we're, most of us as scientists or scholars are not trained in graphics design. So we struggle. And I, I, this over here on the right is a graphical abstract I put together back in 2016. And I honestly, I hate it Thank now. You. That's the best I could conceive of at the time. Are there resources? Sort of like what you do with the tattoo artist. You, when you give them a rough sketch and idea, you're like, I want this. Are there places to go to say, I want this graphical abstract, will you help me make it? Perhaps online. Um, so like one, of the, yeah, one of the links that I gave you, I found yesterday, and it, I think that was provided from a company that will do that as a service. Better yet, if you're in the life sciences or, or STEM world, there's a resource called BioRender. That it's, it, you can do a few of these for free, but if you're going to publish it, you do have to become a member. It's not horrifically expensive, but I designed these two infographics here using BioRender. They have these menus of already built cartoons, so mm -hmm. DNA, microbes. Um, they even had a colon epithelium, so I didn't have to start from scratch because I've done that. It takes too much time. So you can design something using a tool like BioRender. Um, Scribendi is the site that had these tips for designing graphical abstracts. You might find a company there. Um, but make sure when you design these that the point of it is that take home message because the intention is to attract somebody to your article. Okay, tools um, for doing this kind of work. Stay away from Excel, great for analyzing your data, organizing your data, horrible for plots. Um, other software, some people use Sigma plot, but I am a massive fan of GraphPad Prism. Um, you can uh, design figures, individual panels, make them into multi-panels. You can copy formatting and paste it over to other plots. You can do some elementary statistics in Prism as well. Um, it's just very easy to start with and start using. You can get a 30 day free download. Um, they do have um, uh, packages. So if you convince your department head, hey, we need to have this available for the department, you can get discount pricing through packages. So GraphPad is awesome. Another platform, yeah. Is there any way we can get the university to buy us a site license? <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> I'm like, you said it. I tried and was not successful. Um, I know that uh, Dr. Burrow would like for me to get a license for you. Um, so, <laughs> so my part, so what we've done in my department, we we as a department, we have um, a batch license. I think if more departments got on board with Prism that perhaps I could go to software license and licensing and say, hey, this is financially worth it. But right now it's a no. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, R is a free program. If you are familiar with how to code in R, and I've been trying to teach myself over the past couple of years, um, one of the packages that R uses that's really great is ggplot2. A lot of the figures from Dr. Wilkie's book that I've used today are from ggplot2. Highly versatile. You can do almost, almost anything. I tried one thing this morning that's not possible. Mm -hmm. it, there is a bit of a learning curve, though, um, to, to get familiar with this. And I will say the default settings are a problem. The bottom right figure, if you look at that, what's wrong with that figure? Well, it's bilious, but... So red and green together are a problem, right? So those two colors might be a problem for somebody's colorblind. So that's the default color palette in R, which is why it's like, why don't you guys get that default color palette better? So, but you can fix it. You can change the code and you can fix that. So I now use R for some of my figures. Um, it just takes a little work to get that programming done. Leave you with this take on point. I appreciate the extra 15 minutes. 
that's because you guys were really interactive and asked lots of questions. So this, this was fun for me. I hope you came away with something that you can use in your lab. Keep in mind the best graph gives the viewer the great number, greatest number of ideas in the shortest time with the least ink in the smallest space. And with that, we're done. Any remaining questions in person or online? Um, there was someone online who said they don't know the cost, but you as extension have a graphic designer who you can request projects with. So ah, that's an option. Good to know. Thank you very much, Abby. You're welcome. Great.